Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business, and I think we've done it. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset that was originally used in the Gutenberg Press. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. Everything else was printed in regular type. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law book said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify Black Letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Welcome back to Black Letter, the podcast. With me today is Gerald Lamel. Gerald is a partner at Dunlap Bennett and Ludwig. He runs the immigration practice there. We're going to be talking about immigration in a time of COVID and a recent executive order from the White House that has been somewhat controversial. There are things that all companies want, and that includes the ability to move people from one place to another place within their own company, retain talent to recruit students who went to American universities. All of these things are put in jeopardy or doubt, or there are a number of issues that immigration attorney Gerald Lamell, with decades of experience in the field, is joined us today to talk a little bit about the executive order, what he's telling companies about the so-called L1 visas, which involve intercompany transfers, and also what he's telling people about H-1B and how we're going about dealing with this uh, challenging uh, time in immigration and COVID and the political atmosphere, all of that stuff. And we'll stay away from politics as much as we can, but we will certainly talk about the impacts of this order as a practical matter on companies and on individuals as it pertains to immigration law. Gerald, thank you for joining us today. I'll kick it over to you. Tell us what is this uh, executive order and who does it affect? And then we can just go from there. Thank you, Tom. It's always a pleasure to be here. There were two executive orders. The first one actually ended up banning the processing visas at H1B, M1, F1, and L1 visas for people who are outside the country right now. So, for example, we have a number of H-1B clients who we've applied for. Their applications are still being processed, and they actually can start on uh, October 1st if they are ultimately selected because they are in the country. Our clients who are outside the country, however, even if they are selected, the normal start date for the H-1B is October 1st. They will not be able to start until 2021, say without L-1 applications. Now, it is important to them that L-1 applications are still going forward. They're still being processed. The ban does not mean that they, we cannot prepare the materials and submit the petitions, and USCIS will work on them. And in fact, they can even just approve them. But the candidates cannot come to the United States at this point. As a practical matter, what are companies doing to kind of deal with this? Well, it's a very frustrating issue for many of them simply because as a country and as an economy, we're dependent on a lot of talent from uh, overseas because we have not invested enough into our own tech programs and getting U.S. citizens up to speed on the new and novel technology and uses of technology. And many of our major corporations, IBM, Oracle's of the world are dependent on uh, H-1B uh, students, uh, former students coming here and handling our, our, our tech needs. They now are prevented from coming. And this is very frustrating. And perhaps most frustrating is the L-1B Visa. L1Bs are an intercompany transfer. So if I have a company overseas and we have a branch office or a subsidiary or a parent in the United States, it's generally a corporate decision to transfer a talent from overseas to the United States for a temporary period of time. 
because it's a strategic move by the company that, you know, enhances the product. The ban, which not only is to help uh, protect the U.S. worker, prevents L1s from transferring. So companies can't make the decision. The controversial part about that is that they are not taking jobs for U.S. citizens because they already have a job. They already work for the company. They're just simply moving location for strategic reasons to the United States. This is essentially something that's challenging and hurting U.S. companies. What's going to happen? And the pandemic has slowed this down a little bit. But what's, what we're going to see happen is other companies are now going to open their doors to these talented uh, tech workers. And U.S. companies are going to have to make a choice. Either they establish a branch overseas and that's where they handle a lot of their tech activity. And, and I say tech, uh, I should also say science, I should say mathematics, I should say uh, engineering. Uh, in fact, the h one b program started because the defense industry uh, wanted to attract talented individuals from overseas to help our defense system, to bring these talented people to, to, to strengthen us, uh, strengthen the defense of this country. And it's been a very successful program in doing that. So many small companies that are creating the medicines and creating the the disease control working on things like uh, COVID-19 it have been hugely advanced by having extremely talented scientists and medical personnel from uh, other countries uh, come to the United States. It's made us competitive. Those folks now are going to, to, to suffer and ultimately our defense industry. What are you telling companies now that come to you and say, look, I, I would like to apply for an H-1B visa? Are you telling them, forget it, don't do it now? Or what are you saying? Absolutely not. Just the opposite. What I'm saying is this ban is temporary. It will end in 2021. And the fact of the matter is when you're putting together an immigration petition, by the time you get all the paperwork in together, by the time the petitions are drawn, by the time all the affidavits are signed, by the time USCIS gets it and reviews it, six months will have well passed. The fact of the matter is, if you are ready to, to, to do this right now, I would say go on and do it. You're not losing any time. Gotcha. So it's better to get in line now. So my other question for you, you say it will end. Is it going to end because of regime change in the United States, or does the executive order have a time limit attached to it already, like it's a temporary thing? Is there a guarantee that it ends? The executive order runs through the end of, of 2020. So there Excellent. is an end time on the executive order. Of course, it can be renewed at that time. But also, every 60 days, it can be reviewed up until that time. So there, there can be changes that are, uh, are brought to bear uh, up until the end of the year. The other thing I am saying to, to many of our corporate uh, clients is that we've got to get Congress involved in this discussion. Congress is our representatives on these types of issues. And in fact, the Constitution gives Congress exclusive right to uh, legislate immigration. Congress has kind of been absent in this process because these are executive orders and they have not brought the administration to the table to discuss the impact of these uh, these changes on the corporate America. And so we've got to get put more pressure on our congressional representatives to get this at the table so that we can uh, we can be part of the discussion in the future to help shape this in a way that makes sense. Okay. What about student visas? So I, we were talking earlier and, you know, my daughter's at a school where students come from overseas and stay and board, live there full time. And they've left, you know, since COVID, they've gone back to their countries, uh, Korea, Japan, or some of the ones that, that I know of. And I've heard some of them aren't coming back. Is that an immigration issue or are they prohibited now? Let's welcome Natalie Cressy. And Natalie, you're from Canada. Is that right? Yes, I'm from Vancouver. Vancouver. And so are you, so that's English Canada, not French Canada? Yes. English Canada. Gotcha. And you go to Boston University? Yes, I do. 
And so what is, what's going on with you and kind of this whole immigration policy? So right now, BU is still hybrid, so I can still enter the States and my visa is still valid. But okay. as soon as, if BU ever decides to go online, I will be forced to leave the U.S. So right now, oh. my parents and I are deciding whether or not it makes sense for me to go back, if it makes sense for me to maybe take a semester or two off and figure out something else to do because it's a lot of money to be online and still right. not even in the States for it. Yeah. I feel the same way when, you know, paying for my daughter's high school and she went online. And uh, so that's, that is a big challenge. So Gerald, tell us a little bit about how this works legally. What's going on with the Harvard MIT lawsuit? And I guess Natalie was telling me before you got back on that it sounds like BU might be joining that lawsuit as well. Yeah, absolutely. And just to put it in context, I'm going to start from the beginning. The pandemic uh, hit, and on March 13th, 2020, the government announced a national emergency. Now, how this affected the F-1 visa is there is a rule uh, that students in the country on an F-1 visa have to attend most of their classes in person. So that's been a rule with the F-1s forever. In this particular instance, an exemption had to be created. Now, you know, just to make things more confusing in immigration, even though visas are handled, student visas are handled through the State Department and and consular processing at U.S. embassies, the fact of the matter is the student uh, and exchange program is a database of all students in the United States, and it's really basically a tracking system. It allows U.S. government to monitor where the students are and what they're doing. ICE has this rule that you have to attend in person. So, but ICE created an exemption for students during the pandemic, and the exemption was expected to last for the duration. And this is their words: in effect, for the duration of the emergency. On July sixth. A new policy was announced uh, saying that students had to attend classes in person or they would they had to leave the country, basically given that option. Some exceptions were made. The exceptions were if a student could prove that they were taking several classes online, a majority of their classes uh, in person, as well as online. So what Natalia was talking about was the uh, the hybrid. It's a, it's a hybrid. Now, the challenge there is that in order to register a hybrid, the, the schools have to certify the hybrid program and then certify each student within the hybrid program by August 4th which okay. gives them less than a month. Now, there are 1,095,000 students in the country on F-1 visa. All these students would have to be given brand new F-1 visas certifying that they are eligible to stay. That's an enormous task for many universities. Not only that, they, because of the pandemic, a lot of them created a new online program in preparation for the, the emergency lasting through at least through the fall semester. So the Harvards and MITs already announced that they were not going to have in-person uh, classes. Gotcha. They now have to change, change this. They now have to implement a brand new system in order to comply with the new and to keep their... Uh, do they have to add in-person classes in order to keep their foreign students in order to keep their foreign students on an F-1 visa under the new rule. Which does not jive with everything that we're being told by CDC, Dr. Fauci, and other experts in the field as far as putting students together in one room, putting a number of people together in that one room, right, not being able to monitor the in and, in and out so, and, and activities of people. So parents have to make a difficult decision. Do we send our child to an in-person class in this dangerous time, or do we withdraw and leave the country, which has some dangers in and of itself? It's a very, very, very uh, complicated situation. So, so Natalie, 
what do you plan to do as of now? Do you have plans? As of right now, I'm still kind of in a limbo, but right now I plan on going back to school and hopefully attending in-person classes, as well as the fact that I live off campus, so I won't be in dorms or anything, which is also kind of an added safety with my parents and everything, and it makes them more comfortable with me going back. Because it's a controlled environment. Yeah. yeah. And I can control how many people I see at once and everything. So it's just, so that's an added kind of plus to it, but I could still end up staying here or not going back to school for fall or anything. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a tough time for everybody. So it's a tough time. And Natalie, you weren't here for this, but we talked about companies can't move people between offices when they're already employed by the company now. Um, We can't get new uh, people from overseas. And by overseas, Canada's not really over any sea. So just a host of problems presented by this executive order, which expires at the end of 2020. And obviously, you know, depending on the election outcomes, we would expect, Gerald, I think, based on what we know of the people running for office, that we wouldn't have an order like this if there is a regime change, if there is a a different president. It is important to note that there are a couple of uh, important lawsuits. Natalie mentioned uh, BU might be joining the Harvard MIT. A number of major colleges, Duke, uh, Georgetown, a number of them have joined. In addition, some 17 uh, states just filed for injunctive relief uh, from this just today. So, and this is growing because it, it's a massive problem. The basis of this, uh, the super injunctive relief is something called the Administrative Procedures Act, which was passed in 1946. And what it says is requires federal agencies to have a process for changing rules, changing yep. rules and creating new laws and emergency orders. So they have to uh, publish the order. They'd have 30 Notice, days. Comment. Yeah, that kind of stuff. And uh, this this just simply didn't happen. The claims for relief are um, based on uh, the fact that they failed to consider important aspects of the problem for the agency. There's no explanation as to why this was done the way it was done. There's no explanation as to why everything had to change within a month. Why um, it's so important that we have in-person classes in the fall when the pandemic the facts of the pandemic right. have not changed. There's nothing from the administration. As Did you check Twitter? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, Twitter uh, told us that uh, a lot of people are very happy with this decision. <laughs> but uh, government's argument is, uh, you know, what they've indicated their argument is going to be is that they are not changing the law. They're simply reverting back to the original rule, which was that... Um, F-1 visa students must attend classes in person. But again, there has been no input, no discussion with the, uh, the uh, education community. There's been no discussion with Congress that we know of. There's been no discussion uh, with health officials about this. It was just simply done. And it would be a violation of the Administrative uh, Procedures Act. And that is going to be the basis for getting Gerald, if I could ask you, the things that people should take away t- today about this executive order, for c- whether it's a company or a university or a student or an employee, what are the, the, if you could boil it down to three major things, what are the three major things that people should remember? And you're, you're telling me this is not the end of the world and that we should keep applying for things. I suppose that's probably one of them. But wh- how would you summarize this? Yeah, given how long uh, things take, and this really doesn't apply so much to the students as uh, uh, to the business community. Given how long things take, they should should continue to go forward with the applications. It's going to take a long time anyway. The the operative word in immigration right now is go forward. Yeah. Go Go forward forward and press ahead. Even though it says you can't, don't be discouraged. Press ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. As far as the students are concerned, Stay in touch with your universities. Make sure that your international student offices are keeping you informed. They have a responsibility for that, and they should keep you informed as to what's going on, particularly with regard to the injunction, because I think there's going to be a strong case to be made, and an injunction relief may come soon, and we just need to know the parameters of that. 
And the last thing is, uh, you know, always remember, for students is always remember your life is more important than anything. And you do not need to put yourself in harm's way simply because of decisions that are made by, by the U.S. government. You should never put yourself in harm's way. Always look out for yourself and, and uh, you know, and be careful. Thank you so much, both of you, Natalie and Gerald, both. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Black Letter Podcast. Natalie, share it with your friends because now you're, you know, sort of famous. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, be you. Uh, and Gerald, thank you for your time and your immigration know-how and knowledge. We appreciate it. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play so you never miss an episode. And to catch us on video, check out our website at blackletterstudios.com. 